The doors of the output booth slide open, exhaling smoke as the researchers watch with rapt attention. The dial on the console in front of them is set to very fine. A human had stepped into the adjoining booth only minutes ago. A human would not step out. The researchers, feeling some strange, shapeless feeling of unease, ask two of the guards to approach the output booth. These same guards had mainly seen the researchers destroying wristwatches and torturing monkeys with this mysterious machine, so when they approached the booth, the only thing they were expecting to see was a corpse. That's why they didn't even have their hands on their sidearms. That's why, soon, both of them would be dead. A figure emerged from the booth, human only in vague shape. Dark blue skin covered in luminous patches, long, sharp teeth, and a whipping tongue dripping with slime. Too tall, too many eyes. Before the guards can correct their deadly mistake, the monster heaves and vomits, spraying a firehouse spew of neon green vomit. It hits the two guards, who start screeching with pain, screams that are almost drowned out by the deafening chemical hiss of the guards starting to melt. The researchers, tasked with investigating and containing anomalies, had just created a new one, and it was about to go on an all-out rampage. Alarms were sounded, a special response team was called in, heavily armed and heavily armored, to dispatch the beast, but it would not be an easy fight. The creature's acid vomit allows it to melt the door of the testing chamber and escape out into the hall, where it continues to wreak havoc. The members of the special response team open fire with high-caliber assault rifles, none of which seems to pierce the creature's discolored skin. It tears into them with deadly claws, it showers them with its corrosive puke. Before any of them really know what's going on, six more of them are dead, and the Foundation is forced to call in additional support. It goes on for hours. The chase, the chaos, the scientists screaming and running, hundreds of thousands of dollars in Foundation property dealing with corrosive damage, a total of eight dead. So many people injured, and many of the ones who dealt directly with the creature were dealing with partial memory loss. How did they defeat the monster? Well, they didn't. After several hours of rampaging, the creature became unwell. It experienced trouble breathing, slowed down, and started to show symptoms of extreme pain. It collapsed to the ground and screamed a terrible scream before exploding into blue dust and smoke. The problem had taken care of itself. Not long ago, this terrible beast was a 28-year-old Caucasian man, a D-class, but otherwise a completely unremarkable human being, betraying no inherent anomalous qualities. Anything anomalous about him was imbued, not by some group of interest or unknowable eldritch god, but by the SCP Foundation itself, and a very special anomaly dubbed SCP-914. Today is a special case, because a little-known fact about me is that SCP-914 is one of my three favorite anomalies. I'll let you guess the other two in the comments, but I can assure you that they have already been featured on the channel. 914 also known as the Clockworks, is a fascinating safe-class anomaly held in Research Cell 109-B. The composition of the anomaly itself is relatively simple. Two booths, an intake and output booth, connected by a vast series of clockwork mechanisms, covering 18 square meters. Cogs, servos, screwdrives, belts, pulleys, a mainspring… Despite having the anomaly in containment for decades under the watchful eye of the ever-professional Dr. Gears, the exact mechanisms of how the anomaly works have never been fully understood. The part of the anomaly you're most likely to interface with, if ever you're given level 3 research clearance, is the selection panel. The panel has five settings. Each one will cause a different effect on whatever item, material, or individual is placed into the intake booth. I'll give you a quick rundown on the settings, but then we'll get to what we really came here for. Some of the most deranged test logs for any anomaly you've ever seen. The first of the five settings is rough. This will brutally annihilate whatever is placed into the intake booth. For example, a kilogram of steel appeared to have been cut into chunks with a laser. A chimp placed into the intake booth on rough, well, let's just say that animal rights activists would be justifiably unhappy with the results. Then there's coarse. This will also result in the disassembly of whatever is placed into the intake booth, but in a far more methodical fashion. A researcher's wristwatch was placed into the intake booth on course, and it was found in the output booth, neatly divided into its component parts. 
The foundation sadly did not reimburse him for the lost wristwatch, but if it was that important to him, he probably shouldn't have volunteered it for testing. Next is one-to-one, -one, and on the one-to-one -one setting, the result will be a roughly equivalent item or individual to the one placed in the intake booth. To take a rather cliché example, if you were to place a can of Pepsi Max into the intake booth, there's a good chance that you'll get a can of Diet Coke in the output booth. And in case you're wondering, yes, if a person is placed into the intake booth, a relatively similar person aside from slight superficial variations such as race, height, or weight will appear on the other side. Is this existentially horrifying? Absolutely, more on that later. Now things are going to get even stranger with the fine setting. When an item is placed into the intake booth on this setting, the item in the output booth will be a slightly improved version of the original, typically in a non-anomalous manner. Take for example a 9mm Beretta handgun, like the one I keep in the glove box of my Honda Civic. If this was placed into the clockworks, you wouldn't get a laser gun or a gun that controls people's minds, but you might suddenly find yourself packing a Desert Eagle, a far more powerful handgun to say the least. Then there's very fine. This setting has, to say the least, been problematic for members of the SCP Foundation. Put simply, the very fine setting imbues whatever is placed in the intake booth with a completely random and unpredictable anomalous effect. If you place a Tamagotchi, ask your parents' kids, into the intake booth and set it to very fine, it might come out self-aware and morbidly depressed, or it might have the ability to make your head explode with its mind if you forget to feed it. And if you place a D-Class into the intake booth, you might get the acid-spewing bulletproof abomination that we saw in the opening. Yes, that really did happen, and it's the reason why Dr. Gears put level 3 clearance on any attempts to test biological material in the clockworks. That's everything you need to know in order to have a functioning knowledge of the clockworks. And now, we can get into the fun stuff. There are extensive test logs for the clockworks, and I've personally selected some of the most deranged and bizarre tests from these logs for your viewing pleasure. And to remind you to proceed with caution if ever you find yourself granted access to testing for SCP-914. It's time to set the video's quality to very fine and proceed. In a test by Dr. Grangan, five different human corpses were placed into the clockworks to test the different settings. You can probably guess the first five, but the setting on very fine resulted in the corpse becoming a pile of green slime. This slime was incredibly similar both chemically and structurally to SCP-447, an anomaly that should never, ever, ever, under any circumstances ever, come into contact with dead bodies, for reasons you're not cleared to understand. After this, Dr. Gears forbade the testing of dead bodies in the clockworks going forward. That would not, however, mean that other incredibly strange other things wouldn't be tested. A researcher, whose name is now redacted, decided to test some tuna sandwiches in the clockworks. Perhaps he wasn't particularly good at making sandwiches and hoped the clockworks would give him a hand on that front. On one-to-one, -one, it became a salmon sandwich on rye. On fine, it became a far higher quality tuna sandwich, with softer bread and more flavorful and vitamin-rich tuna. And on very fine, it became a loaf of bread shaped like a realistic fish. When the door to the output booth opened, the fish swam away through the air. Nobody knows where it is now, though I will say researcher Jones was seen with crumbs on her lab coat afterwards, which may give some clues as to where the anomalous breadfish ended up. The next test was so serious that it required approval from the O5 Council, the very top echelon of Foundation Command. That approval was granted, and several samples of SCP-939, the nightmarish creature's codename With Many Voices, were requisitioned for testing. On rough and coarse, the creatures were completely obliterated, and on one-to-one, -one, the results were redacted. But the truly frightening things occurred when the anomalies were put into the input booth on fine and very fine. On fine, the creature seemed physically intact, but respiration and vital signs had ceased. The creature was dead. On very fine, the creature was reduced to a pile of smoldering white ash. According to the perspective of SCP-914, it seems that the ideal state of existence for SCP-939 is being dead or even completely destroyed. I'll leave you to unpack the implications of that. Moving on, Dr. Falconis decided to test a copy of the biography Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson. On one-to-one, -one, the result was a biography entitled Bill Gates, also by Isaacson, detailing the life and times of the Microsoft founder. On fine, it produced a DVD of Steve Jobs narrating his autobiography. 
On verifying, the result was a metallic cube. When a button on the cube was pressed, it activated a small hologram of deceased Apple founder Steve Jobs, who appeared to be sapient and able to answer any questions about the real-life late CEO's life. Dr. Curtis, an office joker, decided to get extra weird with it. He included a pack of bacon and a photo of the infamous anomaly SCP-682, the hard-to-kill reptile. This was already on the otter side of the scale. We don't even know how he came up with that. But the result was even stranger. On very fine, the result was a tiny version of SCP-682 made of cooked bacon. Much like the larger, non-bacon version of SCP-682, it was extremely violent and aggressive, but had a pleasing smell, and instead of roaring, it made the sound of sizzling bacon. Dr. Curtis suggested classifying the anomaly as SCP-682-BAC, a suggestion that was rejected by Foundation higher-ups. We're not sure what happened to the little bacon SCP-682, but personally I suspect it might be another victim of Researcher Jones' almost anomalous appetite. Dr. Gears left a note on the testing log saying, Very funny, Dr. Curtis. You are suspended from testing SCP-914 until further notice. Though I have to admit, it smelled delicious. Dr. Greer decided to test a canister of Fox Lab's White Lightning Pepper Spray, which, upon being placed in the intake booth on Very Fine, became a chili pepper. When tested, this chili pepper had a Scoville heat rating of over 300 million, making it by far the hottest chili pepper on Earth. Dr. Clef's suggestion to donate it to Hot Ones was denied. Dr. Armand and Agent McKnight, a duo of huge fans of the Lord of the Rings trilogy by J.R.R. Tolkien, donated a series of their copies for testing. Predictably, Rough and Horse destroyed the books. On one-to-one, -one, the Lord of the Rings compendium book was separated into the three smaller books that comprised the trilogy, The Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, and The Return of the King. On fine, things started to get particularly exciting for any devoted Lord of the Rings obsessive. The book became a copy of the One Ring, the famous mystical item from the novels created by the Dark Lord Sauron to seek domination of Middle-earth. The ring was made out of paper, inscribed with a book-accurate poem in the black speech and the ability to resize to the wearer's finger. On Very Fine, it became a different, shorter book entitled A New Shadow, with a plot centered around a boy called Eldarion. Tolkien scholars would be quick to point out that this was the title of a scrapped story that Tolkien intended to write. Agent McKnight appended a frantic note to the study, saying, You can have the ring, Armand, but I want the book. I'm going to copy this thing. Any Tolkien fans want to read it? This would not be the only time a classic nerd would use SCP-914 to live out certain pop culture fantasies, but the next time it happened would carry considerably more severe consequences. As researcher Mason brought in his collection of LEGO Star Wars X-Wing fighters from home, the tests on most of these were predictable, until of course it was put on the very fine setting, where things got considerably more chaotic. As you might have guessed, it became a real and functional miniature X-Wing fighter. When the output booth was opened, it flew out and began attacking, using its tiny laser cannons to kill several members of personnel. It managed to dodge and weave around all attempts to stop it before escaping the Foundation entirely. Its current whereabouts are unknown, so if you see a tiny Lego X-Wing flying around, I'd advise you to duck and cover. Next, Dr. Dextrania submitted a Beretta M9 handgun for testing on Very Fine. While the gun appeared normal, when fired, its bullets detected the nearest form of life and honed in on them. This had disastrous results, as the bullet weaved towards the nearest security guard and immediately killed him. Strangely, the cause of death was not trauma caused by the bullet, but by cardiac arrest. Dr. Dextrania appended a note to this study, reading, I'm not sure if the bullets should be used as actual ammunition, as they pose a huge threat to other personnel. I'm requesting that testing of bullets on Verifine is prohibited. A member of the O5 Council approved this request. Researcher L. Inzelman decided to get controversial and brought in a copy of Mein Kampf, the infamous book by Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler. On Verifine, the book became a tiny origami caricature of Hitler himself, which would awkwardly goose-step around shouting taunts and boasts. After the creation of Tiny Paper Hitler, the site director gave a mandate that staff members can kick him around in order to relieve stress. For the record, I wholeheartedly approve. Dr. Rodriguez put a full DVD box set of the American television sitcom The Office into the clockworks and set the device to fine, at which point it produced a mosaic portrait of the character Dwight Schrute, played by actor Rain Wilson, made out of fragments of the DVDs. 
Researcher Blaze brought in two pairs of UV-protecting sunglasses for testing on both rough and one-to-one, -one, both of which, strangely, had anomalous effects on the glasses. The glasses on rough became a small pane of glass, but when this pane of glass is looked through in the direction of a light source, the observer will experience severe hallucinations. These include seeing dragons roiling in smoke, birds with blue flaming wings and horns like a goat, and a deer with enormous antlers and, quote, crazy floating orbs. Researchers have conducted further tests on whether these anomalous effects have any connections to the incredibly powerful and highly dangerous SCP-2845. The other pair of sunglasses that researcher Blaze put through the clockworks on fine also had peculiar results, but in a very different fashion. They became mirrored, aviator-style shades that had a mimetic effect on viewers, where they felt compelled to comment on how stylish and hip they looked, a beautiful statement piece to complete any summer look you might have in mind. Researcher Blaze noted, Definitely the most sexy pair of sunglasses I've ever seen in my life. I have to keep them if I'm ever going to get a date. Their supervisor, Dr. Veritas, replied, Sure, Blaze, of course I'm going to let you keep an anomalous object for your personal gain. I stored it in the anomalous item wing for study. Don't ask where, I'm not telling you. The unprofessional nature of Researcher Blaze's conduct was nothing compared to the trouble that Researcher Wood got into for trying to test a vial of corrosive slime extracted from SCP-106. When he attempted to conduct the test, guards wrestled him away and detained him. After evaluation from site directors, he was transferred off-site for safety reasons. The SCP Foundation really didn't need another SCP-106 to worry about. Researchers misusing and abusing the clockworks is a bit of a running theme, as we also discovered with junior researcher Summers. She claimed to be testing a hair clip on Fine, but in the decisive moment, she instead stepped into the intake booth herself, defying all ethical standards. When she emerged from the output booth, she had clearer skin, longer hair, and a better figure. This did not help her when she was immediately apprehended by Foundation guards in the aftermath. Dr. Veritas said in the aftermath, she told us she just wanted to try with her hair clip. By the time we realized what she was actually doing, it was too late to stop her. Needless to say, she's since been terminated, and I hope I don't need to tell you all to not do it again. Researcher Westron decided to bring the ambition back down to sensible levels. He put 50 small glass jars full of strawberry jello into the intake booth and set the dial to very fine. The result was an intricate glass jar shaped like a human skull, filled with the same strawberry jello. The skull's lower jaw moved and vocalized the word squish before never moving or speaking again. Dr. G, a researcher who also had a sideline performing as a gangster rapper in the mid-90s, decided to test a full Santa suit on the one-to-one -one feature. The result? An outfit where the red and white color values were shifted. Afterwards, Dr. G was heard grumbling, Dang it, I was hoping for a Grinch suit. Dr. Lloyd, another researcher, took a cement lion statue from his front yard and decided to bring it in for testing, anticipating that putting it through on very fine would probably result in a rampaging stone lion running around the containment site, so he instead decided to play it safe and test it on one-to-one. -one. The result was not what he expected. It became an exact copy of SCP-173, the sculpture. While it would later come to light that the sculpture was not anomalous like the true SCP-173, upon initially seeing it, Dr. Lloyd did have a panic attack. This is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to test results for the clockworks, and perhaps if there's sufficient enthusiasm in the comments, we'll do some more someday. One needs to be careful when dealing with the seductive nature of the clockworks and its offer of quick improvements. You may just end up getting a lot more than you bargained for. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-2450, Teeth.